Thank you, band and team, for uh, kind of getting us ready right here for the, for the Word of God. Some of you, uh, worship is awesome, but it also preps us for Scripture. It preps us for what God would have for us today, all right? We're, uh, we're going to jump right into it. We are um, starting just a quick four-week series into how to be thankful, man, how as we work into the, the holidays and we work into, con- you know, uh, consumption, really, um, there's a moment where we have to kind of just step back and say, okay, um, what, what, am, what am I thankful for? Because none of those things will, um, one, none of those things will be as good as you want them to be. None of those things, when we're talking about holidays and we're talking about uh, the experiences of family and, and parties and, of course, Thanksgiving and Christmas, none of those things will be what you want them to be without proper perspective. So we are looking at that these next few weeks. If you're young, old, you think you got it all, or you think you don't need to hear it, whatever, come on, zone in to what we're about to get into uh, because I think you will like it. Joy is going to begin. Joy is going to begin no matter where you are. Joy is going to begin with thankfulness. Okay, that's where joy comes from. Um, it's as old as the Old Testament. I promise you, if you look into the Old Testament, God would, 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 would encounter his people and he would say, you will not have any joy unless you're thankful for what I've done for you. Okay, that's a, if you don't get anything today and you went off into some other weird outer space, let me just tell you, okay, joy will come from thankfulness. If you are not thankful, you will not have joy, okay? And we'll get to go into scripture into it in just a minute. I, found this, I saw this video this week um, that hit me, and I want you to see this video of, of this, this village who there's so many things to learn from it, but you'll learn your thing. I'll tell you what I think you, you might can learn from it, but you might see it in something. My but look at the thankfulness in this video right here. Check this out. So many things to see from that. You're like watching the video, you're like, they're singing the same song over and over again. But you see the people in the wheelchairs. Like you see the people in the wheelchairs dancing away as good as they can with no legs, dancing and singing and worshiping to God. Then you see the people working over there, like the, the person just working away, working away. And someone then inspired, right? Someone then inspired to pick up their own, sh- their own shovel or their own tool and say, I see you working with such great joy. Like, and, and we're out here and, and this doesn't look like America, right? This doesn't look like opportunity, but let me grab my tool and let me help. Let me do that. And then this one guy just takes off somewhere. I don't even know where he went. He was just so happy. I'm just going to go for a lap, right? Like I'm just going to take off and run, you know. And then the lady comes to, to the front of the screen with a smile on her face. Like, like many of us, like when you're thinking of joy, like, like, man, are people inspired by your joy? Are people inspired? Like when you say you're, you're a believer, when you say that you have the, the love of Christ in your life, when you say that, are people inspired by that? Are they inspired to move? Are they inspired to dance? Well, a lot of that comes from our joy. It comes from our thankfulness. It comes from, man, like you know this, like you've maybe been in church for, for all your life, some of you, and you maybe seen people that don't have joy and you've, you've said, why do, I, why do we want what that, why would someone want what they have when they don't really even show joy when it comes to, and, and so Paul, right, we, we're continuing in this, 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 these letters, and we went through Ephesians, or, you know, his, his letter to Ephesus last uh, series, and now we're just continuing, and we're continuing, now he's writing to this letter to Philippi, and he's saying to the Philippian church, he's saying, I'm in prison. But I got to I got to write to you about what joy really looks like. And he's writing to them from 
uh, a prison. And you got to remember today, as we look through this, joy is going to begin. Your joy, if you're sitting here saying, I need to be joyful, it's going to begin with thankfulness. Okay, again, tables. So what I'll be, going, I'll be doing is I'll be going through Scripture. We'll be, we'll be um, doing what you've always probably been accustomed to. This guy's preaching or whatever. And then we hit an emergency break. We're like, whoa, what are we doing right now? Well, you're going to discuss at the tables kind of what I've been talking about through Scripture. It's going to be an awesome opportunity, okay? Um, you'll see in, in just a few that there'll be a, a, time up, a timer up on the screen um, that just says five minutes, and then there'll be a 30-second timer that will come up. That means shut it down, all right? Because after that 30-second timer, I'm picking right back up. I don't stop. So um, your table leaders, each one of you have table leaders at your table that will help with that. They'll be like, zip, zip. Stop. All right. There. All right. But if you're, you know, if you're telling your story about Uncle Charlie or whatever, I mean, and all of that, they might be like, tell us later. All right. We got to keep going. All right. So this letter, this letter that he's writing, okay, he's kind of writing this in this, this, this idea that, that knowing Jesus, okay, knowing Jesus, he's just telling them straight out, okay? He's saying knowing Jesus is not just merely just agreeing to a bunch of theological truths, that's not what knowing, and we, we talked about it earlier, that it's not just this religious idea of saying, I, I agree to these religious theological truths. Knowing Jesus isn't just that. It's a deep, personal, transformational, joyful experience in your life. Like, that's what people are drawn to. They're not drawn to, you know this because you maybe have sat across from them and thought, they're not drawn to theological truth, right? They're drawn to the joy that God has brought me. They're drawn to the experience I had with God. That's what people want to hear. You want, they, you want them to go have coffee with you. Well, they want to hear your story. Like, how did this happen? And so Paul, as he's writing to this, he's saying, he's saying in, in, here we go, we're going to go right into it. Philippians 1, uh, starting in verse 3, he says, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God for you. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God for you. He says, whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with great joy, he says. Every time I pray, I make my request for all of you with great joy. He says, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And he says this, he says, for I am certain, I am for sure certain. This is great because when you read scripture, when you have your belief and your experience, do you speak with those terms? Do you speak with those terms that you're certain by what you believe? Not that I think this is right. I think this might be good. I think I might go to heaven. No, no. Are you certain? And so Paul is saying, I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ returns. What a powerful statement for someone to write to you, right? Like you want to hear that. Like you want someone to tell you that. He's like, I'm certain that what Christ began in you, Christ will finish. What God begins, God completes. That's what we need to know. Like what he's began in you, and some of you have been through this, this going process in your faith. Some of you newly, some of you for, for years, but he's been doing a great work in you. And you've seen transformation within your, your home, your relationships, your children. And what God begins, God completes. And when he starts something in you, he wants to complete that. He goes on in verse 9. We're going to skip ahead. He says, I pray, he says, that your love will overflow more and more and more. He says that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. He's saying that your joy will never be what it is unless you have a knowledge and understanding of who God is. Like you can sing the songs and the lyrics can be up on the screen. But unless you know that the lyrics coming from the truth of Scripture that you have to dive into, the knowledge of God and the understanding of God, then you'll never have this full joy. You'll never grow. You'll never overflow. He says in verse 10, he says, for I want you to understand. This is good because this is important as we're going into this. He says, for I want you to understand, writing to the church, you and me, I want you to understand what really matters, he says. Wow, imagine getting that. Like he's saying that to you as you're sitting here and you're so consumed by the worry of life, consumed about the need of life, the things, the wants, the desires of life, the things, the hopes, and the games, and the entertainment, and everything, and we get consumed by it. And he says, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. He says it right away. He says, your joy is going to come from perspective. Like if you want to have joy, then it's time to get the proper perspective about your life. This leads us into the first question today. 
okay? This first question around your tables is going to be this, okay? You have to be able to describe an event or a situation or a time in your life where God brought you godly perspective, where he reminded you that this happened in your life and you knew that God was bringing you back to the right perspective. He wanted to remind you about the joy that you have, okay? All right, you got about five minutes. Go for it. All right, so the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul begins to write to, this ch- to the church, us, and he's saying, okay, you, 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 you got to have joy, and let me start to give you perspective on joy. Again, he's writing it from a jail cell. He's writing it from a jail cell, awaiting either, awaiting either a possible release or a possible execution. But what he's writing to, he's, he's, he starts to say, okay, well, here's where joy comes from, because that's probably your question. Right? You're like, okay, oh, I hear all of that, but, but, but okay, how do you get it? Like, where does the joy, where does the joy co- come from? So now Paul, he's about to tell us where, where the joy comes from. Listen to this, verse 12. He says, and I want you to know this, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. Everything that has happened to me. So you're probably like me. You start to comb over the things in your, in your mind about what you've been through. The, the, the place you are in right now, many of you not are in a, you're not in a prison right now, all right? You're here in freedom. You're here with donuts and coffee, and you got to drop your kids off and get them out of here, you know? You're sitting in a nice warm room, and, and that perspective alone begins to say, okay, well, I'm definitely not in a dark, dank dungeon cell by a candlelight probably writing, and he's saying, that he's saying that, that all of this, everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. So his perspective right there begins to say, well, my joy then, my joy can change by perspective, right? Verse 13, he says, for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, all the, all, even the guards, not to mention the prisoners who were with me and are seeing me write and talk about Jesus and what I saw on the road to Damascus, not, not just them, but the ones who are guarding me. The, 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 the palace guard, they know that I am in chains because of Christ. Like they know that. Like something's happening within their own life. Like my joy in, in, in this dark situation is, to begin, is becoming to be infectious in someone else in their situation. And I wonder that for us. Like I wonder that for us. He says in verse 14, he says, And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here, have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Because of my imprisonment here. See, Paul, he was in prison for the gospel. Like you, you can't be, we can't be twisted or confused. He was imprisoned for the gospel of Jesus Christ the ones he was persecuting and killing before, and he was switched, and now into writing the letters to the church, and now he's imprisoned because of this. And his predicament that he was in, for many of us, can be viewed as horrible. Like, it's, this is terrible, right? Because he's no longer able to travel to these places. He's no longer able, but he views it differently, doesn't he? He views his perspective in joy. And he rejoices because what could be viewed for many of us as a disadvantage was not for him. He said it's not a disadvantage. He states his imprisonment. He says it here. He says, has really served in advance of the gospel. Like your bad day at work. Your bad day at school. Your kids are off the rails this week. Your husband's out on business, and you're doing it by yourself. Your wife is gone to, to her situation, and you got to have the kids this, today or whatever. It's like your situation, oh, my goodness, and you're posting it, and you're telling it. And he's saying this, that all that I'm going through has really served to advance the gospel. Now, does it minimize what we go through? No, because that's where we are, right? Don't, feel, don't, don't be like, oh, I'm a jerk. That I'm right. No, 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 this is where we are. But he's, in hyperbole almost, he's saying, this is where I am, and I'm joyful because it's serving the gospel. And all the Roman guards, they've now heard the gospel. Secondly, he, he, listen to this, Paul's situation has been an encouragement to believers who proclaim Jesus now everywhere. 
Like, like I wonder about that as we enter into this season of thanks. We enter into this. Like, your circumstance, your situation, does, does, do other believers look at your situation and then have more joy and more faith? Like, this is a major problem in the church. And yes, ours too. That we believers are so downtrodden by life that we see each other and we're not inspired. We're not inspired to grow. We're not inspired to, to get up in the morning and go to church. We're not inspired to raise our children. We're not inspired to have strong marriages. We're not inspired to be witnesses at work and at school because we're looking at each other. And we're not inspired. And Paul is saying, not only do we need to inspire the world, but good night. We've got to inspire each other. Enjoy, no matter what you're going through. I'm in prison, y'all, he says. And I'm writing this with joy. I can barely get the food. I can barely get, I can barely do this. And I'm writing this with joy. And because of it, the Roman guards, the ones who are in charge, are going home to freedom and then they're going to their cookouts at home and their barbecues. And they're saying, I got to tell you about a prisoner that I met. His name was Paul. You see, this reality, this is what this tells us. This is how, this is, I'm thinking of this. This is how God takes our circumstances and uses them for glory and good, right? This is how he does it. Romans 8, 28, for, for all things work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Meaning that all things is all. Someone say all. All, right, right. Someone who didn't believe that just say it. Say all. All, all things, all things are used in according to this to make something happen big in the kingdom. Your situation, the thing you're saying, and well, not my thing. Are you kidding me? All things. All things are used. Prison things. Joyless things. He takes all of those things. In verse 19, he says this, For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, that this will lead to my deliverance. You see his perspective? His perspective? And, uh, uh, listen, I, I know. You're, you're hearing this, and, and, and I'm just saying, the perspective is mature. It is. It's a spiritual perspective that's mature. I'm just going to say that to you right now. If you're saying that, ah, yeah, I don't think you have an immature faith. It's just that simple. He's writing with great maturity in his spirituality. He's saying, this is what I really believe because I know Jesus is real. And either, you, my friend would say, either you believe it or you don't. And if you believe it, then something great, something great in your spirituality and in your suffering and in your joy can really happen. Think how often our days are often based on what happened on that day. Think about that. Think how often our day, our joy is based on what happened on that day. You get home from work that day, horrible day at work, your evening is based upon that day, right? Your next day, you don't even want to go back to the work because your next day is based upon what happened yesterday. And that, it keeps building upon itself, right? And if you want to grow in your faith, right, you, he's saying, here's what he's saying. You can't find your joy in the day-to-day. -day. You find your joy in your salvation is what he says. That one's a blower, right? Because that's hard. Because each one of us kind of work day-to-day. -day. And he's saying, if you want real joy, then it's found in salvation in Christ. And your joy, listen, here's the thing. Here's what I would say. Here's a point. If you want to write these down, you want to follow along. Your joy can't rise and fall on your circumstance. Your joy cannot rise and fall on how your circumstances are. It just doesn't work. You know that. It doesn't work relationally in your, in your relationships. It doesn't work for you at your job. It doesn't work with your kids. Your joy can't rise and fall on those two things, and this is what happens. All right, here's what we're going to talk about, okay? We're going to break it down. Here we go. Get ready. Start digging in. Here we go. It's question two. How do you keep? How do you keep? How do you keep personally? And if you don't, you're like, I don't, and, and so shut up, all right? Whatever. Just be honest at the table. How do you keep your circumstances from driving your joy? How do you keep your circumstances from driving your joy? All right, go for it.
All right, so Paul basically says, he says, okay, your joy is going to come from salvation. Like your joy is for, and, and I've said this before, like to, to, to our struggles. Like I struggle with, with up and down with, with you know, my, my attitude. I struggle with my, my, my hope. I struggle with those things. He's saying the joy of our life comes from salvation. Like, and so I've thought about this. Like everything from salvation is a plus. Everything from salvation is just bonus. Like, read scripture. Everything from, from salvation is a bonus because our joy comes from what Christ did on the cross and what he did from the grave. Like, that's what he's saying. He's like, man, so all the other things that you have that become the driving force of your joy in your life, whether your kids are successful or not, whether, whether you know, you get the raise, whether you have money or not, of course, that's the, the, that's the common one, of course. Like, any of those things, if those become your driving force, you're missing out on what Jesus did on the cross and with the tomb. That's what he's saying. Yeah, can I get an amen? Yeah, I know, because that one hits you and me together. I'm, listen, uh, listen, I'm one of these. I'm writing, talking, and believing, and hoping to get all of this at the same time. Because I can let the, 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 the piles of life and of church come over me, and of job, and of, and of responsibility, and things like that, and want to get home and not have any joy. And I'm, I know I'm, I'm still, I'm the, what have I said about the husbands, okay, the husbands and the fathers? You are the joy givers and the joy strippers of your home. You either give it or you strip it away. It's the truth. You can come in and all, you can come in in the worst mood and all, and, and, and mom can be dressed up as Cinderella giving joy to everybody. It, don't, it won't last. You know, you're coming in like Gargamel. That's an old one right there. Gargamel, man. Gargamel. This stuff just hits me. I'm, I'm sorry. Just randomly. It's not in notes, okay? So our circumstances, our circumstances cannot be the driving force behind our level of joy. They just can't. Yet so often, what do we do? We allow our circumstances to impact the joy of our lives. So Paul, he's finishing up verse 20. He says, so he says, for I fully expect, here's what I fully expect. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed but that I will continue to be bold for Christ. He knows when you are, are, are ashamed of your faith, when you're ashamed maybe of, of even how you're living your faith, then he knows that's a, that's a road we don't want to go down. He's saying, I hope I'm, I'm never ashamed of the cross. I'm never ashamed of the gospel because it will affect all of what I'm writing you today. It'll affect how I'm sitting here in prison. It'll affect the letters that I write to the next church. It'll affect who reads it in Bixby, Oklahoma. It'll affect the young person who gets it in a youth group. It'll affect the child who's in South Kids getting the truth right now. He's saying, I hope that I'm never ashamed, but that I would continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And he goes, and I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. How about that? Uh, yeah, I know, I know for, for a few of you that really get that, he says, whether I live or die. And, and then he goes in, like if you don't get it, then he says, no, no, listen, he says, for me, he says, for me to live means living for Christ. If I'm going to be alive and I'm going to live this life, then I'm going to live this life for Christ. Church people, this is right now for you. This is right now for you. In the church, you, you woke up and you showed up. You went to a church because there, you believe there's something happening in a church. You believe that God is doing something. You showed up for that. So here's what I'm going to say today. Here's what he's saying. Living means living for Christ. That's life, he says. So everything else, whatever idea that you have is in living your life, if it's a way or it doesn't have Christ in the center of that, then get ready for there to be joylessness. Get ready for there to be a life that struggles with being joyful and happy and, and relatable and, and marriage connection and child connection and friendships. He's saying, because for me, he says living means living for Christ. And he says... And dying, even better. Woo! Because many of you, you're scared to death to die right now. You're like, oh, man, I heard the stories. Like, we talk about so many stories of people dying. Like, so many stories. And you're, listen, I'm not insensitive to death, okay? I'm not insensitive to death. Here's what I'm insensitive to. That the fact that if we die, then guess what? We died and we're going to be in the kingdom now. Like, I'm insensitive to that, so afraid of, of leaving this life when it's like, really, really, 
Why? Why? What's the deal here? Here's what you should be afraid of. And this is what Paul's saying. Here's what I'm afraid of, he says. I'm afraid of staying here and not living. I'm afraid of staying here in this life and not living. And just walking around hopelessly and, and people looking at me and saying, really, he's a believer? I'm afraid of that. That's what I'm afraid of. And I think that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, listen, living means for me to, to live for Christ. But he says, but if I live, he says, I'm going to do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. He's torn between two desires. I, I had a, I, the other day I got to take one of my, my, uh, my son's friends home from, from uh, KBC, from the fall festival. First time he had been in, to a Christian church like this his whole life. He's, thir- uh, let's see, he's 12 years old, 12 years old. 11, about to turn 12, he told me all that whole story. So he's in the back, and we're talking about, we're talking about uh, what just happened at KBC. And he's like, oh, man, I want to I come back on Wednesday. I want to come back to the youth group. And Mark had talked to him, and we, we you know, we, we, we gave him the whole thing, the whole, I mean, we, we did the whole, this was fun, wasn't it? I'm like, man, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And he's just loving it. So he's in the back seat, and then he starts to say, but he says, this kid is so smart, so smart. He says, but I'm torn between in the back seat. So now I'm dry. I'm like, whoa. He says, I'm torn between two things because my, my, my parents at home don't believe this. He says, and I'm torn between, I know that there's a God. And he goes, and I know that there's a God who, who probably loves me. And he's in the back. He says, but when I go home, I don't know that. He says, I don't see that at home. And he says, and I'm torn between two things. And and I'm sitting here saying so, and, and I went into my, I'm harking back to the youth ministry days, and I'm like, okay, my son's over there just being like, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? And, and, and I, just, I just did. I said, it's, it, guess what? You're little low. I said, you're getting to the, the time in your life where it will be your decision. And now I didn't say go home and tell your parents they can go to hell and all that, you know. <laughs> you know, hell, you know, you got that. You're like, he just said that. No, hell, all right? And that's not what I told him. I said, no, no, you're, you're at the age now where it's going to hit you, where you're going to get to decide. It's, it's hit my son. I, and I told my son right there. I said, Owen, my son, it won't be good enough for him that his, pa- his dad is a pastor. He'll have to decide for himself. Your children, it won't be good enough for them that you go to church and serve. They'll have to decide for themselves. And Owen is saying, I'm torn between. It, he said it, his words, Right? His words, torn between two. I think that happens with us. I think it happens. If we're really honest, we come to this experience and we're excited. We're pumped. But we're torn between the world. We're torn between two. And and we spend six days in the world. And then we come on the Sunday and we snap out and we're like, yeah, this is right. This is what I'm talking about. And then we're back into it. We're back into it. And we're torn between the two. Well, Paul said, I, I, he, Paul says, I'll tell you what I'm torn between. I'm torn between whether living for Christ as hard as I can here or, or, or just saying, Lord, take me because I know I'm going to the kingdom. But we get torn between two things. And I, and I want us to, to know that, that our joy, our joy can't depend on this life. Our, our, our joy shouldn't depend on this life because we're torn between the importance of this life and the things of this life. And the joy that we have. So this last question I want us to hit up right here. Okay, discussion three. Last one is this. And be honest. All right? Don't hold back. This is what's going to make this whole thing real. And if you're just like, I'm going to say this answer. It doesn't really make sense. But whatever. Get rid of it. Don't say that. All right? What desires are you presently torn between? What desires are you presently torn between? Go for it. As I close us out uh, this morning, as I close us out this morning, our band's actually going to, you guys you can join us up on stage. We'll do a final song in just a few moments. Um, it's a time to probably reflect on, on kind of what you um, experienced this morning um, from the Word of God um, that uh, maybe hopefully that God inspired me to share with you. It's that moment to, to just say, you know, okay, am I joyless? Am I, am I joyless? Uh, because here's what we know. Confusion brings joylessness. 
Confusion brings joylessness. If you, if you have confusion in your faith, if you have confusion and you're not, you, maybe you just don't know. Maybe you just don't know what God says about a certain topic in your life. It brings joylessness because it bring, you don't know. You're confused. Like you know that. Like I've felt that. Like when you feel like you don't know what's going to happen in your life, you don't feel like what's going on, and someone will say to you, well, have faith, right? You'll, that, that's good, right? I, you get that, but you have faith by knowing the word. You have faith by knowing what the Bible says. And some of us are so afraid to ask a pastor or ask a, a friend who we really trust that knows the word of God. We're, we're afraid to ask them because we don't know it, I won't, you know, or whatever. But then you're still confused and you're still joyless. And our joy is going to come from knowing. And this is what Apostle Paul saying. You know what he was writing? He was writing scripture to us that we already have read or heard before maybe. Like he was just writing that. He was saying, you have to know the truth of your salvation. Like all of that is in scripture. All of that was in the stories of what Jesus did. And it brought joy to him in a prison cell. Here's what I believe. That the same message of salvation can bring you joy in your situation. But you have to know it from the word of God. Like it doesn't just come with a song, a Christian song you play every now and then on KXOJ on your way to work doesn't work i love that and everything but listen i'm telling you to know the word of god because that's where the joy will come from we uh we want you to read we want you to 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 be in the word and one of the things that we we want to do is help with that through this series, we have a reading plan, and uh, you you just be able to follow along. Some of you are amazing. Like I see you on U version, and you're like, I'm reading, or maybe you're just doing that to, to tell people you you're you know reading or whatever. Um, but uh, but but listen, the truth is, if you're just in it, you're getting the word of God. And up on the screen, you'll see if you text the word joy to that number right there, we'll text you. I mean, we're doing all this for you. It texts back to you. You get the number. You open it up, and it starts for you right then. And I'm telling you, if you're lacking and you're struggling with joy, get into the word of God, all right? Get into the joy. This series, we're going to be talking about it. We're going to dive into it. <clears throat> we're going to be talking more about what Christ means in your life and uh, about where you are in your life and whether or not people look at you with the joy of Jesus Christ, okay? Let's pray this morning. God, you are a good God. Um, you are a God who fills us with your joy because of salvation, that's where it starts. I pray we would know that in this room today, that the bonus of life comes after salvation, that everything <clears throat> from you up and down, God, I pray we keep into perspective. God, I pray we'll, we'll, we'll remind each other of that. <clears throat> Excuse me, in the church, we'll remind each other of that. Father, I pray we'd be bold to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Stop faking to each other, that we would call or text to one another and say, I need you to pray for me right now. I'm joyless. I pray we'd be bold in our, in our prayers to one another. God, we love you. You are a God who honors and loves us. You call us your children, God, and we honor you back, God. Thank you, Lord.